Good morning. morning. Welcome to Crosswinds. As I said, it's a good day day in the neighborhood. God's with us and we're going to uh, we're going to deal with some things today. Uh, part two of overcoming the snare of the fowler and we're going to give you some tools. I want to give you power over a defeated foe. Amen. And uh, if anybody knows where that power comes from, it comes from God because there's no power but of God. And Satan is, I mean, he was put to an open shame. He's been defeated. He's a liar and the father of all lies. And anytime you listen to him, he's trying to war. He's trying to create some sort of a fear, something in you that will keep you from walking in faith. So we're going to talk about some of that today. As I was saying before, Mark chapter 4 says this, that, that uh, in verses 4, uh, 1 through 20, it is Him, the Lord Himself, uh, telling parables to religious people and the disciples. The difference between a disciple and a religious person is, is that the disciple wants to know what God means when the religious people think that that's all they've got to have. God wants to take a person deeper into the things of God and He wants them to have that power operating. You know, have you ever said the Lord's Prayer? It's not really the Lord's Prayer. It's the model prayer for us. I started to sing it today, but my singing is not so great today. But, but the, I started to sing that because, it, you know, the words of that prayer tells us that we are o- under an open heaven. God, through His Son, opened the windows of heaven and He says to us, that when we're praying, that we are to every time we pray, and that's every day, we ought to be asking Him to have His will, His way on the earth as it is in heaven. That means He wants what Jesus did to be done every day and through us. Through us. You know, our lips ought to be able to speak, you know, to storms and they will calm. Our lips ought to be able to do and say the things that Jesus said and have the same result because He said that in John 14. The things that I do shall ye do and greater things than these. Now, if you're religious, you you just don't, you don't even get it yet. But if you're listening with the Spirit of God, you know that God had this intent in Him when He wrote the Scriptures where His Holy Spirit came on holy men of old and His Holy Spirit still comes on holy men of new. And so, and and you have to fight the battle every day. You know, Jesus gave us power over all... He said this, I've given you authority. That's a little different. That means that you have the authority to wield His name and defeat an enemy every time. Not sometime, every time. And I'm going to show you this in the Scripture today as we we close in on some things. You know, I've got some things going on tomorrow. I've got surgery tomorrow and that kind of thing. But, you know, it's it's all going to be good. Uh, You know, how do I know that? The Word of God says all things work together for my good. It also says what was meant for evil will turn out for my good. So I'm not worried about that kind of stuff. In the end of all of this, my eyesight will be better than it's ever been. And, uh, you know, for heaven's sake, I know. I mean, in Parham's time, there was a black man, William Seymour, and he was blind. And, uh, And he went and he started preaching, and then he could tell people what they were wearing and didn't have an eyeball in his head. Do you have to have retinas to see? No, you have to have God. <laughs> That's what you have to have. You, God, God is not limited by the scope of anything that He created, so He can recreate. And He has over the years. He's re- recreated. You know, and, and diseases that come on people need to hear from your voice the words of God. The diseases, uh, you know, 
heaven's open it, it, and He's looking to see if you're going to stand on what He said or you're not going to stand at all. And I'm going to share some things with you today. It, it might get touchy in here a little bit, but just understand, if it does, it's us against Satan. A defeated foe. And I'm not going to allow him to lie and continue to lie to you and you to operate in ignorance so that he can run you down. He can't do that. God has already given us all power over all the power of the adversary. If you're religious, you don't have it. If you are a genuine worshiper, you've got it. And a worshiper is not just a believer. You know, let me say this to you before we get into this deep. Mental ascent. Do you know what mental ascent is? That I believe Jesus died. I believe He was on the cross. I believe He was resurrected and that kind of stuff. That's mental ascent. That does not make you a believer. You see, because when you do that kind of thing, you're not opera you're not walking in him and him in you. See, he came to dwell in my heart by faith. That's what the Bible says. If you have faith, now faith is not just a mental ascent. Faith is believing that he is in me with me now because he said he would be. And because he is, I am as he is in the earth. Is that word of God? He said that I am as He is in the earth. So when Satan shows up, you know, we're going we're gonna to talk about him today. He's going to have a, he's gonna have a bad day. Anyway, Jesus came to dwell in us. He sent the token, the sealer, to live in us too. And, the, and wherever Jesus is, the Father is too. So he dwells in the heart of a worshiper. Now, a worshiper, you know what that means? Worship. It means that you are engaged in a relationship with Almighty God, His Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that you give praises to Him for all that He has done. And this happens not once in a while or just when you feel good or, or you're having a good day. It happens, actually should happen on the worst day of your life. You ought to be shouting your victories on that day because when they were going to battle in the Scripture, they always shouted before they got a victory. There were always praises going up before the victory came. It wasn't after the, the thing happened. It, it's before. And so God wants us as His people to begin to learn how to shout victories on this side of a battle. To actually overcome the adversary by allowing God's Spirit to come and, and, you know, and manifest itself around us. I look for the day that all of you will be worshipers. That you'll be sitting here when I, like I've seen the, so many times and the Shekinah of God would come in this room. And I want to tell you something. It changes who you are when He comes. Amen. It will change you to know that your God is in the room and manifest Himself in a presence like that. I don't know how to tell you. I mean, I've seen that cloud so many times coming here. Me. And I'm going, I'm glad you're here. But, but I know that that could happen with all of us here if we were truly what we needed to be in Christ Jesus. If we truly were worshipers, not just somebody that came to church. I'm the church. You're the church. If you've got the Holy Spirit, He dwells in the church. You're His bride. So, you know, I, 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 look, listen to me. I want us to be able to be so full of God that people have to line people up like they did with Peter. You know, and the shadow. A shadow doesn't have any substance. You know that? 
what there's a word for this. What overshadowed Peter was God. And when whatever's overshadowing you is the shadow that it's cast. And if it's worldliness, if it's if it's church entity and stuff, it, it won't do anything. But when the light of God is shining on you, something that doesn't even have substance, you couldn't touch it. I mean, it's just a shadow because He's shining on you. And what what happened was is that Peter would walk. They would they would lay people in the street, and he'd walk down the street, and the shadow of Peter would would heal people just because God was shining on him. And you remember Peter before the Holy Spirit, right? But he wasn't near the same after the Holy Spirit came and made his abode in him. You can't be God's and not have the Holy Spirit. So you've got to ask God, give me your Holy Spirit, a Holy Spirit. And He changes you from what you used to be to what you, He had created you for, His purpose. Okay, Diseases again. If I say to a disease, you've got to go, it's got to go. Now, do you have to believe? I don't wait, wait on people to believe. Because largely they're backslidden when I'm doing that. They're, they're allowing something that they shouldn't be allowing. You know, some sort of fear comes on. You know, some doctor said something, give you a bad report and that kind of thing. Now listen, I want to tell you something. I wouldn't give you 10 cent for all the doctors in the world. They're not God. As a matter of fact, most of them are so humanistic. There's no room for God. So, and I appreciate medicine. There are times for it. But I want to tell you something. Uh, when I have to stand and tell a doctor there's somebody greater than him, and what he does, he doesn't take money for. You know. <laughs> and he doesn't have to be in a managed practice. He doesn't have anybody over him. Now, you know, I, I look at all those kind of things, and, I'm, and, and these days, with all the stuff that's going on in the world, the adversary is always wanting to give you a bad report. I have never had a doctor give me a good, a good report. All of them were bad. Then I you know, get in touch with God and worship Him and I spend a day with Him and the next thing I know I go in and my tests are changed. They don't understand why the change. I'm going, have a seat. We've got to have a talk. <laughs> this is what happens when you know God. That God wants out of you what was coming out of Jesus. He is sent to dwell in you, to manifest Himself through you. You're supposed to be like He is in the earth. And with that, God will wipe your enemies out every time, not sometime. Are you listening? You need to start listening. Get some spiritual ears on you so you can actually have something instead of a religious experience. You pastors out there too. I love you. You need to get into the Word of God. The Word of God is not just a book. It's a living book. And it will live in you if you allow it to abide in you mightily. Amen? John chapter 4, verse 24 and It's talking to what God wants. The answer for pride, and you see the Bible says, if we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, who will lift you up? God will lift you up. So humility is something we have to practice every day. Humility, not, don't, don't get me wrong, humility is not weakness. As a matter of fact, we're going to talk about the attitude of humility in just a minute. God will give you an attitude. A giant killing one. And so, 
you know, when you get that, you, you've got that confidence in God, you humble yourself in His, His sight, you know He's with you. If the Lord be for you, y'all know the Scripture, do you practice it? See, you cannot fear and have faith. These are opposites. You've got to have that confidence in God that when He says, I'm with you, and nothing can hurt you. Nothing, by any means, can hurt. By any means, can hurt you. It's a good thing, isn't it? Now, see, he's going to scare you because I'm going to give you all of this today, and you'll go home and forget, and you'll be scared because some report will come. Listen, don't listen to a liar. Do you? Why would you do that? He's the father of all lies. And he wants to tell you a lie so that you will fear. And when you fear, faith's out the window. You can't have what God has to give you when you're not. Because without faith, you can't please God. Okay? So, John 4.24 says that we got to worship Him in spirit and truth. He wants people to worship Him in spirit and truth. And 4.23, the easy to read version for, for those of you that don't do exegetical stuff and theological treatise. Anyway, but the time is coming. Jesus is speaking to a woman and He says the time is coming when true worshipers... Did you see that word? True worshipers... Not just somebody that sings on Sunday. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In fact, that time is now here, Jesus is saying. And these are the kind of people the Father wants to be His worshipers. So He knows the difference between false and true. He knows somebody that's cold in heart. He knows that their life is not lining up. They don't care about the things of God, but he knows where there's a true worshiper because the true worshiper, inside that true worshiper, he's got a he's got a focus, a laser focus on God. What are you doing, God? What do you want me to know about this situation, God? I thank you for your promises, God. I'm living in those promises. I claim every one of them. And I'm going to speak them out every time something threatens. Oh, I'm going to pull it out. It's my, my little spiritual machine gun. I'm going, to, I'm going to spit so much Scripture at Satan. He, he won't be there long enough to worry about him. We don't need to give place to the devil. No place. And when we give place, it's because we're walking in some sort of a deception, a lie. God doesn't want us walking in a lie. There's a difference in a lie and truth, right? Okay, Terry. <clears throat> Psalm 22 and 3. In the English Standard Version it says, Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, dwelling in the praises of Israel. In other words, every time you praise our God, God's presence, He's dwelling in the midst of that, that praise. Wherever God is, the adversary is not. Actually, the adversary is fleeing. So the secret weapon in our arsenal, other than having a knowledge of the Word of God, and understanding of that Word in the Spirit, is that we use that word to praise Him and magnify Him in the, in the presence of our enemies. Now, it doesn't mean you won't have enemies around because it does say that, that He will, he, He's going to make a table before, uh, before uh, I mean, our enemies. We will sit down to eat and they'll be having to eat with an enemy. Me. You know, not everybody's a friend. If they don't know my Jesus... They're my enemy because they're serving a different master. 
I'm going get, to get into that scripture a little bit more later. But anyway, Isaiah 61, 2 through 4, it says, To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Can you imagine the acceptable year? I had, I mean, that blows my mind. You know, what makes an acceptable year? Well, it's where the people of God are lining up with our God. All right? And the day of vengeance of our God. Now, I know you don't know what this means, but see, when the acceptable year has come and people have started worshiping like they should, then every enemy gets defeated. The day of vengeance of our God. Every time we start worshiping, there's a day of vengeance. God's going to take vengeance on whatever it is that is trying to attack His own. To comfort all who mourn. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. To give mourning. Uh, uh, give unto them beauty for ashes and oil of joy for mourning. So beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the... What is that word, brother? Spirit. Listen to me. Fear, depression, oppression, Satan. It's a spirit. See, it's not just an emotion. It's a spirit that comes on a person and it's trying to steal from them the victory that God has already wrought for them. It's a spirit and it has to be resisted. And its resistance is in worship and praise and, and knowing the Word of God, allowing that Word to dwell in you mightily. And the adversary won't stay around anybody that's going to be like that. He will flee. Now, I've, I, I, over the years, I've pastored a year or two. And so, in the, in the pastoring, you know, I'd have people come in and they didn't have a right spirit and that kind of stuff. And, you know... It's, it's the old saying, you know, if you can't stand the heat in the kitchen, get out of the kitchen, right? This, is, this happens because people come in and they weren't expecting to come into a spiritual arena. They were expecting to come into some sort of uh, little closed session where people could sit around and, and chat and... No. See, the church is not that. The church is like Jesus in the world. The church is supposed to be driving demons out and bringing the kingdom of God into every environment. Amen. Every environment. We're supposed to be Him in the earth. That's why the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. It was to really upset Satan when he couldn't get... I mean. Jesus is dead now. Oh, no, yeah, but he got up. <laughs> and then he ascended, and then he sent the Holy Spirit, and he filled up these people, and everywhere he would look then after that, he would see little gods. Spirit-filled people. Those people represented the very same thing. This is Jesus' word, not mine. Go read the Bible. Don't give me some sort of theological tenet that you know you haven't studied out. The Word of God tells you what you're supposed to be in the earth. Amen? And if you're not that, you're falling short of God's glorious ideal. Because that's what He's... that's His idea. So, you know, I, I want the people that are around me that, that are struggling to be set free. Depressed and oppressed people, they need to hear me speak to that spirit and it go. And then they began to realize they don't have to deal with that anymore. That's a lying spirit. It's one that says you can't do anything about your situation. It frustrates you. All, oh, listen to me. If you know the living God, you don't have to listen to that tripe. And, and God will give you words to speak back to it. And, and it'll sound like, thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you that you have paid the price for all this. Thank you that you have given us power over all the power of the adversary. Thank you that, that, that nothing shall by any means harm me. Thank you that no weapon formed against me can prosper. 
Thank you. You know, by the time I get through my Thanksgiving list, it's me and the Lord in the room. <laughs> Are y'all still with me? Okay. He gives us the garment of what? Praise for the spirit of heaviness. It's a spirit. I didn't just write this. It came right out of the Scripture. You see, that they might be called the trees of righteousness. That they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. A statement that speaks to what God intended to do with us. People that cannot be moved. He tells us we're going to be like trees planted by the rivers of the water life. And other places, and, and here we see it. And, and Isaiah, you know, that we are the planting of the Lord. He puts us in places. Listen, I want to tell you something. He puts you in a place. There are people that run here and there and, and they're trying to find somebody to tickle their ears. I want to tell you something. You're not going to get what God needs you to have doing that. If you're planted, stay planted. I don't know. I've never seen a tree replant itself. It just grows and grows and grows and the fowls come and dwell in its branches, right? <laughs> That's a, another time. Anyway, and, and it didn't stop there. It says that they be tra uh, called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He might be glorified. That He. Who is He? God. So, He's glorified because of what He's doing in us. Right? Alright. And then it says, and they, that's us, shall build the old waste places. They shall raise up former desolations and they shall repair the waste cities and the, uh, the desolations of many generations. That's dealing with the destructive powers that Satan has brought into the earth. As a matter of fact, that's what we were reading last week. If you look at him in, in judgment, you'll be going, is this the man that shook the nations? Why in the world don't we get God's view of Satan now? And get a bigger view of our God. Our God isn't just a mere man. He's the creator of all that is. The power of everything that exists. And He has given us how much power? All power over all the power of the enemy. So when we are walking in that express place in the Spirit of God, then the adversary is fleeing from us. James. It says, if you submit to God, resist the adversary. Resistance is praise. Humility and praise. Well, let's go. Depression's a spirit, as I said. In worship of God, depression will flee. If I, get, if I get up and I don't feel good, I'm going to cut on music, and I'm going to sing, and I'm going to worship, and I'm going to praise Him and thank Him for His promises and, and quote them out loud. And You know, because if you let the Word of God abide in your heart mightily, and that's what He wants from us, there isn't any mystery about what God wants. He's already said what His will concerning us is. So uh, the adversary is going to have to flee. Fear is, is a heart that is not made perfect in love. That's Bible on it. If you've got fear in your heart, depressive states is fear. Oppressive states is fear. Actually, hate is fear. Envy is fear. All of that stuff has got a root in fear. And so if you allow fear to dwell in your heart, Jesus said, you've not been made perfect in love. But if you allow Him to 
perfect you in love, then the fear will not have an abiding place in you. Now from a neuroscientist that knows about depression, I also know what the deliverance point of that depression is. That fear has to go. When you have your, your ducks in a row with God, I promise you that you won't have the fear factor. Amen? Amen? Would that be a good thing for some of you? Okay. <laughs> you know, God's Spirit comes into us to bring life into us and life more abundantly. But if you don't have His Spirit, you can have, you become like a dead sea. It might flow in, but it, nothing comes out. God wants whatever He puts in you coming out of you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Life doesn't come by you sitting around being a, a dull Baptist. Or a backslidden Pentecostal. Or a charismatic that doesn't know your word. Or a religious person at all. This is a relationship. But when you have received from God His Spirit, now you are His. You're sealed with a seal, a token of what's coming. That means that what's coming is greater than what it already is. And I, I just really have some issues with that. I'm going, how in the world can it get better than it is? I'm going, okay. But it is. It's a token. The Holy Spirit was given as a token of the power of God. It's God coming to reign and dwell in your heart. So, God wants all that old stuff dead. He wants all of this to be new. And then He wants us uh, to allow the life to get out of us. The Holy Spirit was put in us, but He wants to get out. Okay, he wants you to speak in his name and 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 cause you know lives changed, people healed, people delivered. You know, he wants that because that's what Jesus was doing everywhere he went. And again, that's what Jesus said we would be doing. You can't do that and just be religious. You've got to have his spirit. Amen. You're none of His without His Spirit. And let me, let me stop and put a little parenthesis around this so that you get it. See, the Word of God says how much more He would give the Holy Spirit to them that ask. If you ask for bread, He's going to give you bread. He's not going to give you a stone. If you ask for fish, He's going to give you a fish, not, not a serpent. So when He was saying that, Jesus was telling you, all you've got to do to get the Holy Spirit is ask the Father who delights that somebody would want His Holy Spirit to dwell in them. And then the Holy Spirit in them is going to cause them to rise up just as Jesus did and overcome every obstacle, every offense, every sickness, every, every. Well, why doesn't He heal everybody? You ask Him. It doesn't have anything to do with Him. It has to do with the soil that receives the seed. Amen. There's enough evidence for that in the Scriptures. Okay. Either God is your victory cry or you will suffer lifelong defeats. If you're not looking for your victory and, and what Christ did for you and God dwelling in you and His Spirit being in you, see, you're powerless. You can't run after the adversary in the flesh. He will kill you. But if you run after Him, with the Spirit of God, uh, He will be running away from you. We'll, we'll get back to that. Anyway, Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon that is formed... How many weapons? No. 
None. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou, that's me, shall condemn. Say something bad about me. If I know it, there's some condemnation coming your way until you repent. And I hear it most often in the, in the Spirit. Who tells me? i got a God that tells on you. See? So anyway, we get the, the opportunity to condemn things that do not line up with the Word of God. We get the opportunity to cast down something that's said against us that can be a curse. See, you can't be blessed and cursed at the same time. Now, those are two, two different rivers. And so, but the river of blessing is going to cause the adversary have to, to run away from you. The, the curse, though, is on us. If I, if I start feeling something in my body, the first thing I do is I start cursing anything that's said that the Lord has shown me that's been said or anything that I heard has been said against me because that's witchcraft and it's manipulation of spiritual things and I'm going to stand up against that and I'm going to condemn those words so that they cannot have power. My condemnation of those words is to strip it of the power that Satan wanted it to have. And when it's stripped, it cannot accomplish what it was supposed to accomplish. So, no weapon, no weapon formed against us is going to prosper. And every tongue that right, rises against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. I don't think he's all of that. Listen to me. I condemn you for saying it because I received the only Savior. I have Him dwelling in my heart. I know His Spirit is with me 24-7. And no matter what I'm going through, He's not going to allow me to go through it alone. That He's going to go all the way through it and I'm going to come out victorious no matter what anybody else says. It, I condemn a lot of doctors' words, you know. It has worked well for me. <laughs> you should learn to do the same thing. Go ahead, dear. One of my favorite stories. David and Goliath. I want you to see this like it needs to be seen. There's a little boy. He's a sheep herder. His brother's in battle. For 40 days, Goliath has come out, you know, the Philistines' big hero, and he has cursed them. He has cursed the children of Israel for 40 whole days. And little David finds out, he comes and he says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine. He's about this tall. He's got a sling, a rock, and a stick. And he says to Saul, let me go out there. I'll kill him. Now that's an attitude you need to have. Something cursing something that belongs to God is bound to die. It's on the wrong side of the street. And here this little boy, he says, well, let's, let's put this armor on. No, I don't need this. It's going to slow me down. You know, he couldn't, those greaves and all that stuff, and, all, and it's heavier than he, he wants to carry. He said, just let me go out there and I can just imagine that Saul was saying, well, even if he gets killed, it'll give us a little breathing room here. He wasn't going out there to get killed. He was going out there to kill. He said, what do you think I am, a dog? You send a child out here to fight with me? Now listen to, to David. Listen. 
and you got a slingshot and a stone. Yeah. He said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to cut your head off and I'm going to feed it to birds because I didn't come out here in the power of my might. I came out here in the power of the Lord God of Israel. What happened? You know the end of the story? He did exactly what he said. He prophesied the end of that giant and they, uh, the Israelites chase these people down for you know 30 40 miles and kill them the philistines you don't mess with god's people you know when people want to water down what the scriptures mean is listen don't do watering down of anything concerning the Word of God. It is His Word. It will not change. Not one jot or tittle. All of it is just as true today as it was when it was spoken. Amen? All right. Anyway, that's all written if you want to go see it in, in 1 Samuel 17. David has, by the way, everything that David did was he had a God filter. He looked at everything through the eyes of God, what God said He would do and what the Word of God said. That, and, and He would look at everything like that. He did never consider what, you know, something else would, you know, what, what else could happen here. If you get a God filter, that works for you too. You stop looking at yourself because, see, that's, that's where all the problems happen because you start looking at yourself and you're not looking at Him. He created you for Himself. And when you look at everything in your world around you through a God filter, you know that He made you for Himself, for His purpose. And with that, while He has made you that way, you're looking at what He's going to do through you because He purposed you for that very thing. Amen. So you've got to understand that that spirit that tries to keep you from having the things of God has to be killed, destroyed, took down. And it starts with humbling yourself in the sight of the Lord, praising Him with all of your heart, not so others can see to you. It's okay to do that. I mean, there's a difference between the Holy Spirit coming in me and dwelling in me and, and the Holy Spirit coming on me when I'm in a service. Those are two different things. But anyway, let's, let's go on. In Joshua, let's look at this. Our victory is given daily as we humble ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Joshua 15, uh, 1, 5 and 5. It says... No one shall stand against you all the days of your life. How many days is that? <laughs> As I was with Moses, so I shall be with you. I had somebody say, well, that was just Joshua. I said, you don't get it yet. Joshua was the name for Jesus in the Old Testament. And he was going to cause all of his people to go in and they were going to overcome every obstacle, every enemy, and they would end up in the promised land. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. He is here with you and me. He's in this room right now. Just because you can't feel Him doesn't mean anything. God isn't a feeling. God is a Creator. And He's wanting you to line yourself up so that you can actually be aware of His presence when you come in here. That's the reason I get so... Fr Listen, I, I get really frustrated with Christians that don't want to worship. Because they are missing the whole point of being a Christian. Worship isn't just singing songs and about to have sleep. You know, I was, I was looking at a thing on uh, YouTube the other day. Michael Jackson, when he was alive. 
and he was over in, I think, Holland or the Netherlands somewhere, and they had this big arena, and they had literally hundreds of thousands of young people, and I saw worship. And I really got upset about that because people were fainting, passing out just because Michael would say something or show up on the stage and stuff like that. But in church, you can't even get anybody to say amen. You can't think that this is okay with God. By the way, I got loud, didn't I? Listen to me. Have you ever read in the Scripture where His people with a loud voice of triumph? I want the adversary, I think, who doesn't have good ears to hear. Amen. Amen. Uh, i got to go on. Uh, three practical reasons why we worship God. To keep our lives... God-centered. We'll go to the next slide. 103. Well, just follow me along. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. The word bless in the Scripture in the Old and New Testament means to ascribe glory to a name. If I say bless you or blessings, what I'm doing is saying... Father, You're in me to bless someone and I want them blessed. I don't want people to be cursed. I want them to be blessed. Amen. That's the way of God's heart. And when I say bless, it's not just some religious thing. It is I'm releasing the Spirit behind the Word that means bless. And He says, when you speak of Him, you ought to bless the Lord, O oh my soul. That means make a decision in your mind that you're not going to allow anything to keep you from making a blessing of His name in the presence of any... And yesterday at Kroger, there was a lady that was trying to sell me a uh, hearing aid. I said, I had one of those. Drove me crazy. They don't work when your ears work. <laughs> anyway... Sitting in the drawer, seventeen hundred dollars. You what? You know somebody needs one? I got one. Anyway, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Everywhere you go, you ought to be blessing the Lord. I was giving testimony of what the Lord had done for me, and I was thanking the Lord that with this lady, and she said, "Thank you for stopping and giving me that testimony. I've been going through some." I said, "Bless you. You're not going through anything anymore. It's over now." <laughs> over now. I thought she was going to kiss me. My wife was standing there, but you know, <laughs> she had some, never, never mind. Anyway, scary lips. <laughs> Bless the Lord of my soul and all that's within me, all that's within me, everything from my heart has to flow out of me that's a river that's coming out of me. Isn't that what the Holy Spirit's there for? There's a river of, of, of fl a flood tide that's coming out, should be coming out of all of us. You can't be a Christian and not do that. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of His benefits. Is there a benefit in the Lord? I'm still sitting here. Alive after all the stuff I've been through. Many of the afflictions of the righteous. And I don't like people to say it like that. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers them from them all. you got to get to the place that you have His Spirit about what you're saying. If you're dead in the water, you know, and there's nothing coming out of you. Okay? Who forgives all of your iniquities? How many of my iniquities do I need forgiven? That's the reason that word's there. Who heals how many of my diseases? All. Oh. Oh. My diseases. Who redeems my life from destruction? 
who crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies my mouth with good things so that I get prettier every day. You can, get, you can get handsome when you get old, right? Look, some of the people that I've ever seen that ever got old, wrinkles that deep, but you know their, their spirit was so beautiful you couldn't see the wrinkles. So, okay. Next. Psalm 103, 1 through 14. Then he says in the sixth verse, the Lord executes, righteous, executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Don't mess with a child of God. You oppress someone, God's going to execute righteousness against you. Uh, that won't fare well for you. Okay? Listen. He made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Aren't you glad? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go on to the next one. Verse 11, As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward those who fear Him. What did we say fear was last week? Fear is the hate of all evil. Fear is the hate of all evil. So, because you, you fear that you would harbor some evil in you and then the Lord would reject you. Right? As far as the east is the way, from the west, so far He has removed our transgressions from us. Our Father pities His children, so the Lord pities those who fear Him. For He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. But He's the one that put the life in us, didn't He? The breath in us made us a living soul. Okay. <clears throat> Psalm 1, uh, 16 this is the second part to keep our faith in, uh, strong and active. In uh, Psalm 16, 8 and 9, it says, I have set the Lord, here's that filter, I have set the Lord always before me because He is my right hand. That means the power hand. And I shall not be moved. Do you, do you see something in these Scriptures? You see, He wants you to have strength in Him that can drive away every adversary, mm -hmm. every adversity. Amen. No fear. No fear. There's not a Marine in the world that can have what they could have like this. They could drive single-handedly whole armies away. We saw that with David. Okay? I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. Okay. Number three, to keep everything in correct perspective, Matthew 6, 13. And it says, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. He didn't lose any power. The only one that lost power was Satan. And Satan loses it every time you believe what the Word of God says. Okay? Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4 says, Let no one deceive you by any means. By any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And that man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is a God. Can you imagine making Satan your God? 
you know, when I have people that say that they're Satanists and they get around me and that kind of thing, I'm going, you are hopelessly deceived. Blackened, darkened in your mind. That, that light in you is darkness. And you don't know what's waiting for you. And you're not going to like it. Not a little bit. Anyway. 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 4 says this. Perilous times are coming. Perilous times are coming? I think we've lived through a year or two of that. Anyway, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Y'all have any children like that? Anyway, no, I, never mind. Unthankful, no gratitude, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders of, uh, with, without self-control, brutal, despisers of, of good, traitors, heady, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Pleasure seeker? Better look up. My pleasure is not down here. It's in Him. Because he, you, can't, you can't have the pleasures that God gives to you. They're intrinsic, internal. And He gives you peace. Not as the world gives, but He gives you peace like the world can't give. Okay. Psalm 149, 6 through 9, it says, Let the high praises of God be. What's high praises mean? Yeah, praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. That's the Word of God. To, exe to, what? to execute vengeance on the nations. I pray for my leadership, but the truth is, is that until they repent, they're my enemy. I have a king, not a president. Okay? to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them uh, the written judgment. This honor have all of His saints. Praise the Lord. This is coming. They don't see it. But the day that we come back with the Lord, He sets up His kingdom for a thousand years. And there is going to be some horrible things going on in the earth. Because the people that were rulers, sinners, people that, had, that did unjust things to believers, all of those people are coming to, into the vengeance of God. Can you imagine? And it will come through you and me. Did you just read that? Okay. Oh, Lord Jesus, You came to set captives free. Thank You for deliverance from the fowler's snare this day and for Your strong name. Father, let everyone in this room, everyone watching, be a partaker of You. Save every soul. Deliver every spirit. Redeem every life that's watching. And in Your name, Lord, receive our praise and our glory for what You did through Jesus Christ. To redeem a wretch like us. That we're the inheritance that You sent Jesus for. It's beyond my thinking. But I thank You. I honor You and I praise You. For it's in Jesus' name I pray and release a blessing on these people right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay.